Okay, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, first BMAX lecture, uh, a lecture that uh, is connected to our program here at Bocconi University in uh, economics management and computer science. And uh, how best to start uh, this uh, series of lectures than with uh, Professor Alfio Quarteroni from APFL Lausanne and Politecnico di Milano. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Borgonovo, for this uh, very kind introduction. and. Uh, and especially for inviting me, it's a, it's a real, real, real pleasure and a, and, and a honor to uh, uh, lecture in uh, such a prestigious uh, university and, and this uh, very uh, prestigious course. Uh, so as you see, my, my lecture will be on mathematical modeling. Um, and uh, let me start with, I hope you see my first slide here. Um, yes. All right, Great. very good. Um, so I, I, I will start with some keywords. First of all, we start with a sentence, uh, uh, which is a bit uh, synthetic, but I think it expresses uh, nicely uh, the attitude of mathematicians. Mathematicians want to represent the real world through equations. So there are three words, mathematicians, real world, and equations. And, uh, and, and this is a kind of cartoon that I'm going to show you. What is the real world? The real world is something that we're interested in um, understanding or simulating, say. It could be a physical process, uh, an environmental process, an economical process, uh, whatever kind of prob problem you, you, are, you are aiming at solving. And uh, you, you take it into this magic box uh, that you can call the, the, the mathematical model. Uh, then uh, you agitate this box and, and you end up with uh, equations. That is the mathematical world. So this is the translation of uh, a real process, a real phenomenon, into equations. And, and this is what mathematical model does indeed. So the old knowledge is embedded into this box. And, uh, and the, what, what can we do today with models? Well, let me say that the, 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 perhaps there are no uh, fields of knowledge, fields of science, where mathematical models cannot mm -hmm. uh, be used. Of course, sometimes very successfully, uh, some other times less successfully. Is a, is, a, is, is, a, is a work in progress. Uh, let me mention some of the uh, um, environments where, or fields where mathematical models certainly are used uh, every day in a very success, su successful way. Um, we all know the uh, forecast, the meteor forecast. Uh, and uh, you know that uh, uh, to get the meteor forecast, you need uh, to solve equations very complex equations. Those are the equations that regulate the motion of the atmosphere, the physics of the atmosphere. You can use a similar kind of equations to predict rare events, like flooding, for instance. Um, we use mathematical models for optimal design, manufacturing, in the uh, automotive industry, in the uh, aeronautical industry, and in many other contexts where you have to end up with optimal shapes. Um, and of course, the, the meaning of optimal here uh, can be manifold. Uh, for instance, for, uh, for the airplane, like this, the one that you are seeing here, optimal could mean that it's um, very stable. It resists to turbulent um, uh, motion. Uh, it, uh, for instance, it, uh, it has a very um, low footprint, ecological footprint in terms of noise in terms of uh, fuel consumption and so on and so forth. So optimality is really um, shaped on the basis of the specific problem you are, you are dealing with. You know that we use mathematical models and algorithms for uh, 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 finding uh, real-time uh, schemes that simulate the, um, um, for instance, the risk assessment in financial markets every day, every second, every, basically every transition, financial transition is now regulated by uh, or, or, or driven by, by mathematical algorithms and so on and so forth. So it's a very long list of uh, potential applications that I could mention here. But what is there behind? How can we try to summarize in very few keywords what a mathematical model is? Well. I would say that you have three basic words. First of all, the model, which is sitting in the middle. This is the magic box, right? And this model often 
almost invariably is obtained by basic laws of physics or biology, of medicine, of economics, and so on and so forth. So here is where you have the knowledge, the core knowledge of the problem. And this is where you use your core knowledge to uh, end up with equations. This is kind of universal knowledge. Um, if you have um, equations to uh, simulate uh, the weather for today or tomorrow or for the next week, uh, well, the same equations, the very same equations will be used in any possible context, in Milano, in Lausanne, in New York City, in uh, the desert. The equations are all the same. What does change are the data. So the data are there to feed the equations, are there to feed the models. The model is invariant in space and time, is the real knowledge that we have. That will change and will depend upon the problem. So what you see here are data coming from the clinical environment, for instance. And of course, once you have this data, this is the fuel for your engine, which is the model, you produce solutions, right? So you have data feeding the model and producing solutions. So in all possible cases, you end up with this type of reference parallax. Um, let me start with an example uh, that is uh, somehow uh, inspired by the time that we are living, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So how can we try to end up with a mathematical model for that? Well, uh, first of all, this is a long story. The, probably the very first successful model that was proposed, of course, not for COVID-19, but for uh, for an, uh, the study of MX, were proposed by two um, Scott, two Scottish uh, scientists, Kermack and McKendrick, um, about 100 years ago. And this was called SIR, SIR or SIR. Mm -hmm. And SIR means basically that you have three categories of people, susceptible, that is people that are still uninfected, for no matter type of uh, uh, kind of, uh, of say, of, of disease, right? It could be cholera, it could be uh, influenza, it could be um, COVID, right? So those are uninfected people, people that are susceptible to be infected. This is infected. So this is the first category of people. You can think at the very beginning, all people, the whole population is susceptible because the epidemic is not yet there, right? Then you have I, which stands for, sorry, which stands for infected, I. And then you have R, that stands for recovered. Recovered are either people who are healed or people who died, unfortunately, right? So Kermak and McKendrick, uh, long ago, they proposed this model, which is based on three categories. They called it, they called it these categories compartments. So it's a three compartment model. Susceptible, infected, they're recovered. Today, uh, of course, we need more sophisticated models with several more compartments, like, for instance, the one that you are seeing here. Um, here there are, you see, eight different compartments. Uh, you still have the susceptible, then the infected are actually split into uh, five different compartments. The asymptomatic, undetected, the diagnosed, the ailing, sorry, the ailing, the recognized, and the threatened. And then you have the recovered. And the recovered are again split into two different compartments, the extinct, people who die, unfortunately, and the healed people, recovered, right? All right, so we have eight compartments, but what is the relation, which is the relation between all these compartments? How does a susceptible people who is still healthy, uh, enter into the infected area? Or how does an infected people end up to be completely recovered or to die? Well, you need equations, you need relations, which are expressed through equations. And actually, these are differential equations. We'll see them in a moment. But let me, first of all, say that in this very kind of picturesque representation of the model, we have many 
symbols. Those are parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and so on, and so forth. And those parameters are there to characterize the specific type of epidemic, the specific type of contagion. I will end up with that because uh, uh, I, would, I would like to make a comment about the use of data-driven model on, uh, on this specific context later on. So which is the model? Here is the model, right? It's a horribly looking system of differential equations. And as you see here, of course, you do not have to enter the detail, but just to grasp the uh, rationale behind the symbols, you see we have the susceptible and then you have a dot. A dot means derivative in time. So we are looking for the variations in time of all these categories of people, of all these compartments. And as you see, these derivatives are related with the, the other compartments as well. And you do it for the susceptible, for the infected, for the diseased, and so on and so forth. You have those parameters that enter in this model, sorry, and uh, you have an extra term, which is this one. Actually, these are complex terms that are expressed by a matrix a mobility matrix. You want to see the way people move on the territory because the contagion is brought by people. If people do not move, if we are all confined, we know that sooner or later the contagion will be over, right? The infection will be over, but we have mobility and you need a mobility matrix. What is the mobility matrix? Well, this has to see with the mobility data. So you need this data. Data are everywhere, right? You need this data. And this is an example of the intercity mobility map in Italy. So we represented Italy through its about 100 provinces, so big cities, and, uh, and, uh, and we ended up with creating a graph of mobility between all the cities. We need those data to fit the model. If those data are inaccurate, the model will be inaccurate. We, only need, we also need other data indeed. For instance, I'm just quoting one of those data. You need data on mortality. This is, for example, a representation of the mortality of the number of deaths per 1,000 inhabitants for municipality until March 31st in Italy, in northern Italy. And this includes Milan and includes the Lombardy, as you see here. So uh, there is a map, there is a color map, and of course, you go from light green to light blue, and this is an increasing uh, map in terms of the value. Of, of, of people who, who died. Uh, now, you all know that those data, especially in the first phase of the pandemic, of the epidemic, say, were not reliable. Uh, the phenomenon was uh, by far underestimated. But those are the data that fed the model. And if you do not have accurate data, remember, your model will never be able to produce accurate solutions. Let me go back and that. Uh, Again, return to this slide. If you have garbage here, you will have garbage in the solution, right? If you have inaccurate data, you will have inaccurate solution. So the model has a universal value. However, it needs to be fed by the right data. So this is why data are so important. But again, data by, the, by themselves are not enough to reproduce accurate solutions. They need the model. So the interplay data and model between data-driven science and physics-based science is of paramount importance uh, in, uh, in, all my, in all my presentation. So this is just an example. So what type of result do you have? What type of solution do you have? Well, here are the curves you are used to, right? This is one example. And you see the curve. This is, you see the green curve. So the yellow curve is the one that's diagnosed. Um, the, the blue one is the recognized people with uh, the contagion. Uh, then you have the threatened, and then you have extinct. And you see the solid curve, which is the one uh, predicted by the model, by the mathematical equations, and you have the crosses, which are the real data that you have on, on the ground, say. So as you see, until end of June, where this model has been used, uh, uh, the model was capable of predicting, uh, say, more or less correct number of, uh, of, uh, um, of results, say. Uh, now, one big question is whether these models have a capability, a predictive capability, which goes 
far beyond the time where it has been produced. Can we say that will be a phase three and phase four and phase and, and, and other phases where models can predict in an accurate way what will be going on? This is a very big question. It's a matter of quality of the model, it's a matter of quality of data. If you do not have accurate data, which is a problem that has been affecting all the countries in this pandemic, if you do not have accurate data on an accurate way or a coherent data to, to get to collect data, we cannot expect having uh, accurate solutions. So let me go to the physics-based models. And by physics-based, I mean models where that, that stand on a solid um, um, the physical understanding. When I say physical, I mean, every, I mean everything, right? I mean something that comes from the real world. It could be physics, it could be biology, it could be uh, economics, it could be finance, and so on and so forth. I mean something real, okay? So I try to summarize in this picture the difference, the macroscopic difference between physics-based models and data-driven models those that will then be associated with artificial intelligence, machine learning, artificial neural network. What is a physics-based model? We have seen it already. You have a model that is derived by a specific phenomenon and which is invariant in space and time. And then we have data that fit the model, let me call it D, I, data, and then, and then a solution that is produced by this model. Okay, so the green line here is the one that is based on physics, on the basic knowledge set. The Newton laws of dynamics, uh, the second pre thermodynamics, uh, any type of uh, um, the, a macro, say a model of macroeconomy, any type of uh, model that is derived by a deep understanding of the real world. Say. Then here on the other row, we have models that are driven by data. You have input, which consists not only on data, but also on solutions. This is very important, right, on observations. Then you have artificial neural network, for instance, and then you produce an output. Sorry. Now you have to train the artificial neural network on the basic of this couple data and solutions, right? And, uh, and then you have to test it. Uh, behind, sorry, beyond the, the range of data that they're being used for training. Now, these two processes, training and testing, are very important to end up with something which can ideally produce results even um, beyond or far beyond the range of the data that, that has been used for, for the training. Say. So, as you see, the approaches seem to be completely independent. And this is one way to look at them. You can proceed with two different type of lines where you have physics-based models and data-driven model and going on independently. This is what is very often done today, right? If you enter a physics department or mathematics department, very likely you will see people engage with this type of, uh, see, physics-driven model. If on the other hand, you enter a computer science department, just to mention one, you will very likely see people uh, involved with these type of models, uh, models based on data, right? And very often the two communities do not communicate, which is a pity because my personal viewpoint is that there's a lot of room in between. And I'll try to show you later some examples for that, okay? So these are, let me, for the time being, stick with the, uh, uh, with the phys physics-driven models. Um, now, if you want to find a kind of very uh, sketchy conceptual rationale, uh, well, you can think that the physics-based model are those where you need very few data, and a lot of knowledge, physical knowledge. On the other side, uh, if you use data-driven model, you need big data. And actually, this is why data-driven model, artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, is so important today because you have big data, right? So um, you have 
two different cones here. A lot of a priori knowledge for physics-driven models with little data necessary. And on the other side, uh, you see um, many data in, uh, uh, in data-driven model and a little knowledge, right? So these are the two alternative, basic alternatives, if you want to, to use a shortcut. Now, physics-based, well, uh, here is an example, right? It, it still pertains to the uh, optimal design. And, uh, and this is in sport, um, which is not surprising. Between uh, in sport, you have uh, uh, plenty of room for improving your knowledge in terms of improving the performance from one season to the other, uh, the performance of, 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 of your competition, say. So this is an example that they took from the um, um, uh, America's Cup uh, competition, where I've been involved for three uh, um, different competitions from 2001 to 2010. And actually, uh, I had the, the chance and the fortune to, to, to lead the team at TPFL in Lausanne of uh, mathematicians uh, who designed the, the boat. And, um, and we won uh, the competition in 2003 and 2007. And, uh, and we, we, we reached the final uh, in 2010. Uh, so here is the year staff. And, uh, and here are two uh, America's Cup uh, uh, boats, um, um, monohull boats uh, competing. And you see the different appendages that you have underneath the water. So you see the sails, right? And then um, uh, you, you see, uh, uh, of course, all the appendages. You see the, the, the keel, you see the bulb, and you see the winglets. Um, now, the colors are referring to the pressure that is acting on these two boats, right? Um, the boat that is following, uh, this is a downwind leg, is uh, receiving more pressure because uh, it, it's receiving more wind, uh, and uh, this is why it's more red than the other, because the values of the pressure are higher. Remember that in this color map, blue is always at the uh, lowest size, side of the scale, and red is the upper side of the scale. So here we are just simulating in 3D uh, the um, behavior of, of two boats that, that are competing. I, I told you before that these are physics uh, base models, and this means that there are equations that you directly derive from physics. Now, I, I'm, I'm not pretending to uh, provide you any uh, insightful explanation of these uh, uh, equations, but uh, just to tell you that uh, the first set of equations is the one for the hydrodynamics part, namely uh, the one that is there to compute the velocity and the pressure in the water and uh, in, in the wind. And then uh, um, uh, this is in the air phase, and this is the water phase. And then you have interface condition between what's happening in the, in, the, in the air phase and in the water phase. And the interface is just uh, the, the shape of the wave. And at the interface, you have equations that are connecting the two set of equations. So those equations are there to express the variation in space and time of the characteristic variables, which are, in this case, the velocity field, the three components of the velocity field at any point, and the pressure field at any point in space and time. Now, should you be able to solve uh, those equations, we'll be able to reproduce the simulation that we have seen before and to have a very precise um, knowledge of what's going on. Um, uh, this uh, is the hull of uh, an America's Cup boat, actually the one that Alinghi used in 2003. And uh, let me run it again. Um, this is uh, what mathematicians call the free surface. Uh, these are the, these are the waves that are generated by the impact of water and uh, and uh, the um, uh, the hull. Uh, now this simulation is very important because um, uh, ideally we like to have a wet surface which is the lowest possible because in this case we are going to reduce the aerodynamic uh, forces uh, and and therefore to um, uh, improve the performance of the boat. This is a study on what's happening uh, underneath. In the water. Uh, this is the bulb that is seen uh, from, uh, from the front side. Uh, these are the two winglets, and this is the keel. And uh, the one that you see on the backboard is the rudder. Um, so here is, uh, these are the streamlines. Streamlines are the ideal 
uh, trajectories um, of uh, every single uh, water particle. And you see these big turns, these are big vortices, and actually the motion is turbulent past the appendages and uh, the, 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 cap the possibility for the mathematical model to simulate the, the amount of turbulence that is generated is extremely important because this will help in uh, optimally designing the shape of the bulb, which is this very heavy um, uh, component of the boat, which is there for stability and, and for the other parts, the keel, the hull, and the winglet. Uh, this interaction with the wind, uh, when you have um, um, wind particles that are uh, hitting the, 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 the sails, um, uh, you see you have these big vortices that are generated. generated. Again, this is a turbulent uh, motion. You are creating this kind of depression, and this is important because uh, your, your, um, your sail will lose the stiffness, and, uh, and then it will not be um, um, performant anymore. So again, this is important to end up with the optimal shape of the shape of the sails and also with the optimal um, fabric of the sail because it's a combination between fluid dynamics properties and material properties of sails. Of course, you should be able to simulate the real stuff. This is the real stuff, right? Then you have to apply your models to this type of environment where you really have a competition. And this is one of the um, of, of, of the um, a competition that we had uh, in uh, during uh, the, the, the 2007 uh, America's Cup, and uh, so you should be able to simulate your mathematical model. Should be able to simulate all what's going on here, and as you can understand, uh, physics is fairly complicated. Um, but but this is why uh, you, you 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 this is why you you can hope to be able to uh, exploit all the knowledge that is uh, coming from uh, see physics, the fluid dynamics, mathematics, and and bring it into the equations. And, uh, and then allow the equation to reproduce the, uh, the reality. And on, on this ground, to end up with the optimal shape of uh, the old components of the America's uh, Cup uh, Yogi. So this was one example. This is another example. I give you two examples, which has a completely different type of flavor, right? Uh, this comes from medicine. Um, and the idea, or if you want the dream, is to, have, to end up with the mathematical model of the human heart. This is a very ambitious project. So what is the basic motivation? The bo basic motivation is the one that you see here. According to the uh, WHO, um, there are about 18 million people uh, who die uh, each year from cardiovascular diseases. Um, and, and they represent uh, about the 31% of all deaths worldwide. This has a tremendous impact on our lives on the society and the and on the economy, as you can you can guess. Only in Europe, the cost is estimated on the order of 200 billion euros per year, the cost of those diseases. Uh, and we like to try to help doctors with more quantitative models to help them understanding the, the way this fantastic machine, which is our heart, works, actually. So let me give you some figures about the heart, just to tell you how extraordinary, extraordinary is this organ. It's a small organ, right? About 300 grams weight over, say, in an adult, you know, 70 kilos or 80 kilos. So it's really negligible. It's like uh, uh, you see the weight of an avocado. So basically negligible in, in a body. Um, it pumps five liters every minute, five liters of uh, uh, blood, uh, seven to hundred liters daily, which is sufficient to paint uh, 2,500 cars every day. So this is what a regular heart does every day. Um, it beats, in the average, um, 42,000 uh, times per hour, um, 100,000 times per day, 3 billion times in the span of a lifetime, three billion times, right? Um, I'm sure you do not know any other machine that lasts so long. It produces an incredible amount of work, even though it is almost completely empty 
because it has four chambers, uh, which are the two iterative ventricles. And the word that it produces for every single heartbeat is comparable to the one that is necessary to squeeze a tennis ball. If you have experienced this type of uh, uh, operation, you, you understand uh, how, how much effort you need to squeeze a tennis ball, right? It ensures the blood circulation in a network of about 120,000 kilometers of vessels, arteries and veins and capillaries. So this is three times the length of the equator. It nourishes 37,000 billion cells in our body. So 30,000 times 10, sorry, 37 times 10, 10 to the power uh, 12 cells in our body. So this is what it does. But how can it do that? How does it work? I guess you all have an idea of the function of the heart. The heart has four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. Uh, the blood entered through the vena cava is a venous blood. Uh, is carrying, is, is, it is carrying toxic substances like CO2 and others, right? And other ways to say. Uh, it, it enters the right atrium, it passes through a valve, which is the tricuspic valve here on the left. It enters then the right ventricle and then it's pumped through this valve, the pulmonary valve, into the pulmonary artery. It reaches the lungs where it releases these wastes and it gets oxygenated and then it returns to the heart through four, four veins, the pulmonary veins. It enters the left part of the heart, the left atrium, and then through the mitral valve in the left ventricle. And then when the vent left ventricle squeezes, contracts, then it, it leaves the heart through the aortic valve, it enters the aorta, and then it's going to feed all these sea vessels in our body. But this is the mechanical part. Uh, wh what, 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 is, what is the engine? I mean, we don't have a battery here, right? We need an engine. What is the engine? Well, the, the engine is uh, uh, due to a signal an electric signal that is generated spontaneously, fortunately. We don't have to do anything for that, right? At a specific place, you see on, on the right, you see this sinoatrial node. So it's generated here, and then it's propagated to um, the whole heart through a fast network, which is the one that you see here. It's called the Purkinje network. It's a kind of fast network of highways is propagating into the whole heart and it reaches all the cardiomyocytes, the cells of our myocardium. And there, uh, there is a very complex uh, biomechanical process that takes care, that takes place, sorry, uh, that is a polarization and depolarization of every cell. This creates an active force that is generated. This allows every single cell to contract and to relax, and, uh, and the aggregated mechanism produces the contraction and the relaxation of the whole heart. And this is what then originates the whole thing. So you have an electrical stimuli that propagates into an, an electric potential, an electrical field uh, in the whole heart, and then you have contraction at the cell level and the, the organ level. Can we reproduce all this mathematically? Well, as always, when you are facing a very complex problem, you have to try to simplify it and uh, decompose it, split it into subcomponents. And you want to then dominate completely the subcomponents. We call them the core models here, right? And the subcomponents are the electrophysiology, meaning uh, the electrical field that is propagating into the whole organ the mechanical activation of every single cell, the mechanical deformation of the whole organ, the whole myocardium, uh, the valves that are opening and closing, the fluid dynamics inside the chambers, the four chambers, right, the two atria and the two ventricles, because this is where we have blood. Blood is a fluid, and, uh, and then we want to see the way this fluid behaves in these chambers. And then we have the perfusion, perfusion because you have the coronaries, the coronaries are there to feed the muscle, to feed the heart itself, right? So the coronaries receive blood from the heart and they return blood to the heart 
and they perfuse the myocardium, they bring oxygen to the myocardium. So those are all the, say, the core components that you have. And they are all connected together. And uh, uh, writing a mathematical model of the heart means that you are able to go into every one of those core models and uh, translate them into equations and connect all those equations together. So what you find is kind of most mathematical problem. This is the heart. This is the mathematical heart, right? Believe it or not, this is the mathematical heart. So those are equations that translate the physical principles that have been shown before. If you are solving this problem, you will be able to see the way the heart functions. So it's not an artificial heart. Be aware, there is not, nothing physical here, right? There is no device, physical device. There are just equations. If you solve those equations, you have all the variables that are able to describe what's happening in our heart. Um, so it's a kind of virtual world. You, 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 you hopefully remind my very first slide where we have this, say, real world jumping into, plug, plug into the, the, bo the, the magic box of the mathematical model, and then, and then uh, you shake the box and you end up with a mathematical world. This is the mathematical world. This is the mathematical heart, right? So what can we do with that? Let us see. This is a real heart. This is a real heart, and what you see here are the fibers that are there to allow the electrical field to propagate into the heart, and they permit the heart to contract and to relax. So this fibers, there's no way to get them from medical images. So uh, in spite of the fact that the medical images have made tremendous progresses in the past 10 years, uh, there's no way to get them for a real heart, for a, for a heart of a real patient. And how do you get them? Well, you get them by algorithms. You start from partial images and you use mathematical models to reproduce them. Of course, I have no time, and of course, this is not the focus of the lecture, but what you see here are the fibers of a real art that have been reconstructed by mathematical models. Those are data, and those are missing data. You have to reproduce those data because those data will feed the art, right? So this is a kind of pre-processing. Then you need the geometry, the shape of the art. Every art is different from everyone else's art, right? Uh, so you need to reconstruct the shape of the art. Again, there's a lot of mathematics behind that. At the end, you end up with one heart, which characterizes that specific individual. And when you have these, these data, you have the shape and you have the fibers, then you can run your equations. You can try to solve your equations and produce results, like the one that you see here. Here you see the electrophysiology. You see the electrical stimuli that is originated at the sano sinoatrial node that it propagates into the, uh, the complete heart, right? So the blue that the area is not yet activated electric. When you see a, a color different than blue, it means that you have already have a potential, electric potential there. So this is obtained by mathematical equations. You see here in a transversal, say, view of the heart, and you see here on the left, uh, on, the, on the surface of the heart, the way every single cell of the heart are activated. This is a healthy heart, a heart that is behaving properly, right? However, when you have this model, you can play, quote, quote, and simulating diseases. This is not an healthy heart. This is an heart, a heart, actually this is the, uh, the left atrium, um, with uh, um, a very perturbed, um, sorry, again, with a very perturbed electrical process. And this is unfortunately quite, unfortunately quite normal. Uh, I mean, this is not exceptional, right? Um, you can get tachycardia or, or even fibrillation. And you see those are the equation, those are the um, uh, solutions of the electrical potential. And you see the very chaotic way this front propagates into our heart. And uh, actually doctors call this uh, electrical chaos, right? Um, and when we have this electrical chaos, the heart is not beating harmoniously. And if it does not beat in a, in a contract and relax in a harmonious way, it will not be able to ensure 
the ejection of the amount of blood that is needed to nourish all the cells of our body. So this is a big issue, right? So mathematically, you can try to simulate those type of processes. And of course, the goal at the end is to try to help the doctors in curing this type of uh, problems. Uh, doctors in those cases use ablation. Ablation means that they enter with a catheter into the heart uh, um, through the vena cava, for instance, with a camera and with a laser, uh, and uh, they try to uh, burn uh, the tissue in those specific points where you have the uh, propagation, uh, formation and propagation of these uh, vortices, like electrical vortices, say. Uh, and, and this is a very invasive procedure. It might take uh, two hours up to four or five hours sometimes uh, with, with, the, with the patient in the, in the operating room. Can you help doctors to uh, find the right spot where to burn, where to ablate? And, uh, and reduce the number of ablation and reduce the number of the, 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 the number of hours, the time um, for this operation. This is the goal of this of this study. Um, this is yet another simulation that we have. This is fluid dynamics. Uh, this is still the left atrium. And what you see here is the way blood flows into our left atrium. Again, this is a healthy heart. This blood entering through the four um, um, pulmonary veins, uh, it enters into the, uh, the, 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 the left atrium. And what you see on the right are the uh, vertical structures that are generated. You see, um, it's, um, it's a ki quite impressive type of uh, dynamics, of blood dynamics, which happens in uh, our heart, in a healthy heart, right? And uh, this is very important to simulate because you see, as you can guess, these type of images, we never be able to have them by clinical images. So this is something that supplement clinical images. These are quantitative values. You see here we have a scale of values and every point at every point, we know what is the velocity, which is the pressure, which is the vorticity and so on and so forth. Um, this is the uh, left heart. You see, we have the left atrium and the left ventricle. And you see the way it contracts. Look at the volume, uh, the, the, the change in the volume from the systolic phase where you have contraction and the diastolic phase when you have, say, the um, uh, full relaxation. So this is the blood entering in the atrium, is the oxygenated blood, and then it passes through this valve, which is the mitral valve. It enters into the left ventricle, and then through the uh, aortic valve, it enters into the uh, main aorta and it reaches the whole circulation. Um, uh, these are the coherent structures, the vortices that are created in our heart, right? And uh, the fact that there is this mixing of blood is very important to ensure that uh, there is no stagnation point. There are no points where blood particle can stay and never move because this will create coagulation. and This will be very, very dangerous for us. Um, uh, this is a ventricle, this is deforming, and this is a ventricle with a tachycardia, right, with an irregular um, electrical field, and that's the way it, uh, it is deforming. And on the right, I do not have time to explain, but it's a way you can pass this information to doctors in terms of the performance of the ventricle, such a ventricle. So the study is finalized to provide doctors with uh, quantitative indications of uh, the behavior of a vital organ like the heart um, with, uh, with data, uh, with solution that will not be available through medical images. And uh, this is, I guess, last picture for the, for the, for the heart. Uh, this is the aortic valve, which has three leaflets, which is opening and closing, opening and closing. And you see the particle, the blood particles that are ejected in, a, in this dynamics. And uh, uh, well, one of the uh, curious or interesting uh, aside or corollary of, of this investigation is that uh, you see, you can see the age of the blood particles in our heart. Uh, what do I mean with that? Uh, well, you can, uh, you can, you can, you can wonder uh, how long a blood particle enter into your left ventricle and stay there for how long? And you can end up with these mathematical simulations that in a regular heart, 
it takes no more than three heartbeats. So the age is three in terms of heartbeats, no more than three heartbeats for a blood particle to be completely ejected by, by, by the left ventricle. So the, the, the washing, uh, if we can use this expression of our heart, uh, is, uh, is uh, occurring over uh, no more than three heartbeats. Um, those computations are very demanding in terms of time. So this is the slogan, right? One week for one second. What does that mean? Well, to simulate one second of real life, which roughly speaking is one heartbeat, it takes order of magnitude of one week on a big supercomputer, right? This on the, on the, super, the biggest supercomputer that uh, there is in Switzerland, and this has a, a power of 27 petaflops. 27 petaflops means uh, 27 um, um, mul multiplied by 10 million billion operations per second. So a uh, million billion means 10 to the power 15, right? Uh, this means 27 times 10 to the power 15 operations per second. This is the uh, strength, the power of this computer. And still, you need one week per one second. So you understand there is a tremendous challenge at the mathematical level to have those algorithms um, more efficient in order to, to, to provide doctors with results in a very quick time. And this is where data-driven models can be actually used. Um, now, data-driven models, well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a dark, it's a dark labyrinth, right? It's a dark, dark forest. You have many um, buzzwords, right? Deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, big data, and, and so on and so forth. Um, well, let me try to oversimplify the story, right? You have artificial intelligence on the external layer, then uh, you have machine learning, which is a specific aspect of artificial intelligence, and then you have artificial neural networks with deep learning, um, which are, uh, uh, say, specific algorithms that uh, uh, enable uh, machine learning to, uh, to, to have very high performance, say. Um, so artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, I guess most of you know that um, artificial intelligence are techniques uh, that enable computers to mimic the human intelligence. And uh, there is a, a, a very long list of potential applications where uh, artificial intelligence have proven to be very, very effective. Artificial vision, um, um, self-driving cars, uh, uh, speech uh, uh, recognition, natural language processing, robotics and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, it's so difficult to uh, define what artificial intelligence is that uh, in, in 70, 1970, Larry Taylor say that artificial intelligence is whatever hasn't been done yet. This is also creating a, of course, this is not a definition, this is not a mathematical definition, but it, 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 it renders the idea that, um, I mean, there is no limit uh, to uh, the, front of advancement front of artificial intelligence. Um, now, machine learning is a, 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 an approach to artificial intelligence. In the fields of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed for that. This is one possible definition. Now, you can enter into a more specific definition, which I would say is uh, uh, operational, and this is due to Mitchell in 1997. And uh, uh, Mitchell says that this uh, machine learning is a computer program. Sorry, uh, he say that a computer program is, is say to learn from an experience E with respect to a specific task T and some performance measure P uh, if its performance on the task T measured by the performance measure P improves with the experience t so you have the experience task the performance measure and uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, and and you have to mix up all those things together well this is a very classical example i'd say a very uh, very simple example right given a picture x write a program returning y equal to 1 if the picture is the picture picture of a the picture of a dog or a zero otherwise right very simple uh, um, task you have a picture and to say that whether or not this is a dog. 
and uh, if, if yes, why? The result is one, uh, otherwise it would be zero, okay? Now, with traditional programming solution, you write a computer program that implement, implements a, uh, a set of decision rules which are enforced by the programmer. This would be the traditional way to approach the problem. If you use ML approach, machine learning approach, you collect a, a set of training data that you call X at I, Y at I. Those are pictures and those are Y are the solution, the answer, which is one if it is a dog, zero if it was not a dog, right? So you have N pictures that we're going to use to train your model. Then this is very important. You have to select a set of candidate models. The way you want to express Y, which is the solution as a function of X, which are the data, the input data. And here you take the liberty of uh, inserting parameters that are there to train the model. The model, the training of the model is made by a minimization principle. You want to minimize the discrepancy between what has been predicted and what is the truth, right? Now you have uh, a new picture and uh, you want to see whether or not your, uh, say, machine learning algorithm is predicting the right solution. So you are, you are, you are uh, minimizing the sum of all the discrepancies and you need a regularization term. Otherwise, your minimization uh, algorithm will not uh, produce uh, any meaningful results. Um, so if you go back to the previous definition, this is the task. Recognize whether or not a picture is a dog. This is the task, right, in this specific example. What is experience? Experience is the training set. You have a, a series of pictures that you know, a priori, if it is supervised learning, whether or not they refer to a dog, right? And, uh, and then you have answers. And then uh, you have a performance measure, which is this one, right? It could be the sum of the distances, and here the distance is, can be defined in many different ways, right? So this is the way you, you take the, you measure a performance. Then you have the model M, and we see that artificial neural network are one specific instance of this model, and then you do an optimization algorithm. So here the content, here is the context. Artificial neural networks, you know, are, are say devices, mathematical devices that try to reproduce the behavior of uh, neurons, of the biological uh, networks that we have in our brain. And you can have many different type of uh, examples. You have input layer, output layer, and then you have uh, intermediate layers. And if you have many of them, you talk about deep neural networks. Right? Um, now, you have many different examples of uh, artificial neural networks. I have no time, of course, here to elaborate on that, but there is a lot of mathematics that goes behind because then you have to minimize, you have to find the model and then uh, you have to minimize it. And uh, here is one example, right? You have uh, the input is a phase and, uh, and the output is, uh, for instance, to decide which is the age or, or the sex or nationality uh, and so on and so forth. So you can uh, start from training set and then using uh, intermediate layers that are there to detect edges or combination of edges and uh, creating objects and at the end uh, to produce a real face and to decide whether or not uh, this has a specific sex or or which kind of age and nationality and so on and so forth. Now, let me uh, try to approach the conclusion. I hope you're still there. Emanuele, are you still uh, uh, listening? Thank you very much. No, 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 okay. we, are, we, are, we are all there. Thank you, very interesting. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. So try to approach the solution, The sorry, the conclusion, right? Um, I, I, I told you at the beginning that we have physics-based models and then you have data-driven models, those that are based on uh, uh, machine learning or artificial neural networks. Say. So with the physics-driven model, you have data, then you have a model, and then you have solutions and an output. And then model consists of first principle and the constitutive relations. I will say a word about that. Uh, whereas on the, on, the, on the lower ground, you have data-driven model. You have the training data, the training set, 
you need to train your artificial neural network, and then you have a new data and you want to find a solution, which is an output. So the two words, the upper part and the lower part, can live completely independently, right? But is there an intelligent way to merge them or to combine two different strengths and, uh, and to have a cooperation, not a competition? So that's the idea. So how to have artificial neural networks cooperating with a physics-driven model? Oh, by the way, the, the picture that you see here is the eigenfunction of the Laplace equation. Uh, well, this is a kind of uh, mathematical uh, jargon, but just to, to tell you that it's not a, a, just a, a, a nice picture. It, it represents a real solution, say, of the problem. Um, so uh, let me skip this kind of philosophical um, uh, picture uh, statement. And uh, uh, here is an example. Here is an example where we have a physics-based model, but we need we may want to use training data and artificial neural network to find something that in the physics model is missed. And these are constitutive relations. Uh, this is a difficult word for, 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 for most of you, I guess. But what do I mean? Assume that you have a material pro you have a problem and you have a, you have a physics model for material science. You have the macroscopic matter and you have the microscopic matter. You know the way macroscopically your model will react, your boat will react, the wing of your, uh, of your of the aircraft. But maybe you do not have a precise physical principle for the way at the microscopic level, at the single cells, at the single atom, say, uh, or molecules, uh, you, uh, you, you, your, your, your material will behave. Uh, in some cases, you are fortunate to have considerations. In other cases, you do not have them. And we want to use artificial neural network to have the microscopic behavior um, of your specific material. You want to deduce it from data. This is one possible cooperation, very useful. Um, uh, this is another one. Uh, you do not have enough. Uh, um, you do not have. You do not. You have missing part of your model, and you want to learn the model from your, your trained data. And this is something that is very beneficial. For instance for the COVID pandemic. It's very difficult to end up with, a, with an accurate model for many different uh, uncertainties that you have in, uh, in, in the behavior of the individuals, right? I mean, uh, you want to see if you set up confinement measures, if people will respect confinement measures, uh, or if people remove, and uh, you do not know if you have super spreaders or people that are, who are a symptomatic and spreader or people who are symptomatic but not spreader, right? So this is one way where training data collected on a very big amount of people, right, uh, could help defining a better model. Or um, the way you want to simplify the complexity of your model, remember, one week per one second. Can you end up with physics-driven model, which uh, will take not one week, but for instance, one minute to simulate one second of heartbeat? This would be of interest for doctors, right? So we use artificial neural networks in a suitable way to project your model into a subspace of much smaller dimension in order to be able to solve it very, very quickly. It's another possible cooperation between the two. You want to solve inverse problems. You want to, to find the sensitivity of your model to parameters or to end up with finding parameters that are not there. You don't know them for your models. For instance, honestly, don't know which is the conducibility, the lateral conducibility of my own art. And every specific art has a different type of lateral conducibility. Can I find it by measures, for instance, by the electrocardiogram, right? This can I reconstruct it. This is an inverse problem. It's very difficult to solve mathematically. But again, this is where artificial neural network have been used very, very efficiently. And uh, just to give an idea without entering the details, here are artificial neural networks at uh, work for obtaining the um, active force that is generated in our heart at every single cardiomyocyte of our heart. So you see on the lower part of the picture, you see this uh, electrical signal and the active force that is generated. 
if you see the solid line, which is the one predicted by the neural network, you see also the dashed line, the points, which are those that are indeed measured, right? And you have a perfect agreement between the two. And this is a real-time simulation. So this is one way, one out of many other possible ways, where you can use artificial neural network to speed up computation of a very complex physics-based model. And my personal belief is that uh, you see, uh, to have a relative error of 10 to the power minus 3, uh, you have a, a, a reduction of the, of, of, the, um, of the computational time by a factor of 10. So you have a speed up of 10, and you have a, a memory saving of 100. So this is going to be very important in practical applications. So my personal belief is that uh, if you can combine suitably and in a smart way, physics-based models and uh, models based on data-driven, like machine learning and, and artificial neural network, you will have the, the, the key of the success. Uh, really sorry that I, I took a bit too long. Uh, oh my, my God, yeah, it's a bit too long. And uh, well, in case you can you have questions or curiosity, I'd I'll be, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you very much for your patience. No patience at all. It was a, a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Very interesting, uh, uh, really. Thank you very much. I, I, I think I so I give you my applause because I said that the, the number of participants doesn't allow the platform uh, for for more interaction. But so I think I think you are getting a virtual applause for for all the ones and we have something like two hundred and fifty uh, eight participants. Um, so really, a big applause is coming through the net, although uh, you're not uh, you're not directly seeing it. So I. I I don't know. I, I didn't receive an email from from the public. So if you want to send me an email with a question, I can then uh, uh, read it to Professor Quateroni. Otherwise, I will just ask uh, my own question. That uh, um, you know, it's uh, concerns the fact that uh, indeed uh, there will be in the future a, a, a convergence between uh, uh, physics models and uh, artificial intelligence, with artificial intelligence sometimes even playing the role of an enabler. So. If you can learn some part of the model and simplify the computation, then uh, computations will be fast. So the, the, in this way, the, the role could, could be that of an emulator. There is also some, some recent literature on that. So then the question is, um, how do you see the problem of sometimes making clarity? This We have several numbers that go into the model, a, a black box that processes inputs and then uh, um, gives out output and sometimes people are scared about you know the complexity and therefore they say we should refrain to use complex models you should refrain to but sometimes complexity is a part of the picture so do you have any recipe for that well i mean this is a very good question um, um my my answer is that it really depends on the type of model uh, we have models that are it's not only a matter of complexity of the model it's really a matter of uncertainty right it's more a matter of uncertainty uh, make, let me give you two examples um, if, uh, if, I, if, I, if I want to, um, um, to, 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 to decide whether or not uh, a, a, um, an airplane, a new airplane, a new concept of airplane, right, will, be, will have a certain type of performance in terms of uh, fuel consumption, in terms of uh, 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 lift uh, and therefore stability, in terms of uh, a noise that is generated. Uh, I, I think this is a very complex problem because you have... Uh, of course, high speed. Uh, you have um, um, you have turbulent flows. Uh, you have uh, acoustics, uh, and uh, and you have uh, the propeller, and you have the combustion, and so on and so forth. Um, so you have very complex equations. But I would say almost all the coefficients, parameters, elements in the model are known. So there is a little uncertainty, and I believe that uh, um, it is not really impossible to deliver the solution to the level of accuracy that is requested by the designer. If you take the COVID, it's a completely different story. The equations are much, much simpler, far, far simpler. We're talking about, as you've seen before, differential equations, right? Ordinary differential equations uh, uh, rather than partial differential equations. It takes um, order of uh, less than one second to solve those equations in a, in a laptop. Whereas it took me, you see, order of weeks to solve a single heartbeat on a big supercomputer for the heart, for instance. So if you take the COVID pandemic, right, you take those equations, those models, uh, it's not the complexity of the model itself, but it's the uncertainty. 
you have too many parameters that are uncertain because these have to see with the behavior of the people and, uh, and among, among other things, say. And uh, there's a lot of stochasticity. Uh, and, and this is, uh, there's a lot of noise in the system. And this is where uh, problems arise indeed. So um, you have seen that in the media, uh, you have seen different type of voices, right? And different type of, uh, uh, and different crit and, and, and criticism against say mathematical models of course people in general do not know what mathematical models are but they think that everything which is behind a, a curve might even be a simple statistical curve right is a mathematical model um and in fact the point is that uh, um uncertainty is generating the difficulty and to get rid of the uncertainty you need more sophisticated mathematical uh um mathematical tools and uh, and this is really where the experience brought by artificial neural networks when you can work on uh, reliable data can actually help uh, so conclusion on this issue is that is not really the complexity of the mathematical model itself is the uncertainty that affects its coefficients or its parameter that is playing a major role Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so now let's see. I received the message, but uh, okay. So there is no no questions uh, on that. So I think uh, um, if uh, I said there are no further questions, I would really again like uh, to thank our speaker, Professor Alfio Cortellone, for a super lecture. Very interesting. Very deep. And uh, really, thank you very much again, Alfio, and uh, to all of you. Have a nice uh, evening and see you at the next uh, BMAX lecture. Thank you again, Alfio. Thank you very much and a good evening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.